No. It looks like a quorum, so I'm going to go ahead and welcome everybody to our educational webinar and mosaic of Italian wines. I'm Lars Light. I want to thank you on behalf of the Psalm Journal and Santa Margarita USA for joining us today. Remind you that this is being recorded, uh, and you can find the recording on psalmjournal.com as well as our Facebook Live uh, platform. And we encourage you to refer to the study guide for a mosaic of Italian wines that was published in the August-September issue of the Psalm Journal. Uh, you can do that with your hard copy or a digital edition. If you don't have a hard copy, you don't have a sub subscription, let us know, Lars at psalmjournal.com. So I've had the very good fortune to spend most of September, this past September in Italy, including several of the properties that we are virtually visiting today. Uh, and over my 35 year career in the wine business, I've gotten to know many of today's speakers and come to immensely respect the wines that they are presenting. It's a small world, but the wine world is even smaller. Uh, I want to encourage our participants to submit their questions through our Q&A feature. You can send greetings via the chat, but by all means, if there are pointed questions, please put them in Q&A so we can fish them out there and address them uh, as much as we can. So a mosaic of Italian wines. What is a mosaic? We all know what it is. I've got sort of one behind me here. A mosaic is a piece of artwork made up of uneven, even imperfect pieces that come together to form something that is uniformly stunning. Vittorio Marzotto is with us here today representing a dynamic family who has had a tremendous impact on the world of wine, both in Italy and the U.S., and he's here to tell us about the spirit behind that mosaic that his family has put together. Vittorio, welcome. Ciao, lads. Benvenuti. Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutti. How are you? Uh, so I'm Vittorio Marzotto, yes, and um, I represent the fourth generation of the Marzotto family, founding company of this uh, wonderful uh, brand Santa Margherita, but not only. And I welcome uh, everybody today to, to be part of this session. Um, a lot of fun, a lot of wines. So I know we have to move fast. Um, a little bit of history, of course. So uh, my great-grandfather, uh, Gaetano Marzotto, uh, had a, a dream uh, back in the days, a dream of uh, having uh, uh, nature, people, and technology uh, working in synergy. And his, his dream came to, to life uh, when he began uh, revitalizing an abandoned land in the Venetian countryside, so we're in the northeast of Italy, and uh, made his dream uh, possible. And such an aspirational, aspirational place could only bear uh, a name. His love, his uh, wife, uh, Margherita. So, such, so the name Santa Margherita. So that's the, the introduction to, uh, you know, about 85 plus uh, years in, in, the, in this industry. And, uh, and then not only with the brand Santa Margherita, but as we're going to um, you know, see now and go more in depth. We we kind of expand our footprints in all the, uh, for us the most interesting uh, uh, regions of Italy, from north to south. Um, and so here we are. Just uh, let get get ready, and uh, we can start with our uh, team to explore all the mosaic of Italian wines from uh, Santa Margherita Gruppo Vinicolo. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, Vittorio. Grazie. Um, so first up, as we say in baseball terms, since this is baseball season in the U.S., um, first up is wine educator and brand ambassador for Grupo Santa Margherita in Italy and also a uh, big person, big man on the scene in the Italian uh, sommelier community um, is uh, Alberto Ugolini. Alberto uh, is presenting to us something very special from Santa Margherita. Santa Margherita, we normally, especially in the U.S., associate immediately with Pinot Grigio, it's iconic Pinot Grigio, but it was actually started in Prosecco. Isn't that right, Alberto? Yes, thanks, Lars. Uh, it's very right because, uh, hi, everybody, in any case, uh, Santa Margherita is famous around the world because of Pinot Grigio, but we have to remember and you have to know that nine years before uh, the discovering and the release of the first Pinot Grigio on the market in 1961, uh, Santa Margherita began to produce a sparkle, a sparkling wine. In 1952, the winemakers of Santa Margherita uh, began to produce a sparkling wine from the hills of Valdobbiadene. We were one of the first wineries to produce Prosecco, 
di Valdobbiadene and write it on the label. Uh, this is very important thing to know that we wanted, uh, they wanted to uh, explore the great potential of glera variety, an aromatic, semi-aromatic grape variety in the hills, in the steep vineyards of Valdobbiadene area. They, these vineyards are so steep in some places that some, someone said that they are a slap to logic and a kiss to the earth. This is a poet because it is a slap to logic because they are really so steep that it's really very difficult to harvest or to treat the vineyards during, uh, during the year. But the poor subsoil, the climate, the closeness to the mountains, and so the temperature range gives the possibility to uh, exploit great potential of aromatics and to explore not like a still wine, but in a sparkling method. According to Charmat, or we in Italy love to say Martinotti, because it was an Italian who invented first this method, it, it means a second fermentation not in bottles, long second fermentation and staying on the lease in bottle like Champenois method, but in tank is a shorter period, two to three months, a shorter in order to keep the aromatic compounds of the basic wine and uh, have at the same time the bubbles. And Santa Margarita was one of the first winery to make this more than no, close to 70 years ago. So it's not a question of fashion, but it's a question of tradition. And a tradition, another famous composer said that the tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. It means not something dead, but the preservation of something warm. And so the tradition of the place, but renewing in a method that gives these very aromatic compounds, they're very lively, floral notes and fruity, the precision of fruit, what makes the difference between Valdo, uh, sorry, this is the Prosecco Superiore di Valdobbiadene. It is not Prosecco, sorry. It is Prosecco Superiore. You have to remember because it comes from the hills of Valdobbiadene. Prosecco DOC comes from the flatland and the next one, we have some uh, of these. Flatland. The difference is not the method, it's the same method, it's not the grape, it's the same grape, it's the terroir, I mean, it's the place these grapes come from. And in a sensory profile is the precision of fruitiness you can find in Superiore di Valdobbiadene, some floral, some spicy notes, and long lasting and richness compared to his uh, we say his brother coming from the flatland. So it's a very exciting Prosecco di Valdobbiadene. You see on the label, you see the, the, the bottle, the label uh, want to represent the mosaic on the floor, on the pavement of San Marco Church in Venice, because we want to uh, recall to Venetian style, and we are in Veneto, I'm Veneto too, and uh, we want to, uh, recall this uh, discovery of Venetian people and our desire of joyful times. And this is a very wonderful wines to pair with appetizers, but to drink alone as aperitif, to drink with appetizers, to enjoy with friends, with the family in every moment. And this is a brute, not so much sugar, residual sugar, uh, in order to make the terroir comes from. I let you, Lars, to, to uh, explain the sensory profile so I can pour and enjoy with you. I'm sorry for, <laughs> for the That's other That's okay, people, thank but... you, Alberto. You know, that was, uh, if you were uh, on the webinar, if you tuned in early, you heard my bottle pop and that was the first wine that I had. Um, I always love to talk about how Prosecco is really the symbol of hospitality in Italy and it will not be very complex necessarily, but it always has great elegance. And this wine really personifies that. It's crisp, it's clean, it's a beautiful, well-structured wine. I can see it as a wonderful aperitif. 
uh, as well as going with a, a whole range of foods throughout the meal. So very nice job on the uh, Santa Margherita Prosecco Superiore from Valdo Biadine. Um, we should uh, have everybody go home and practice Valdo Biadine uh, and see if they can um, win a prize okay. for being able to pronounce it correctly. Uh, so the last time I saw Alberto was in Venice in early September, and he introduced me to a new style of Prosecco. Uh, also delicious, a rosé, which is not in the DOCG or the superi Superiore uh, of Santa Margherita, but he had a lovely example from Torresella. Uh, Alberto, what do we need to know about this brand new innovation coming onto the market, Prosecco Rosé? Yes, this is a very new uh, product, innovation, about the consortium of Prosecco DOC. So in Superiore DOCG from the hillside, it's not allowed to produce a Prosecco Rosé, or you can do it, but not call it on, on the front label. So Prosecco Rosé coming only from the flatland is a, a very interesting way to exploit the, the large production of glera we have in the flatland by adding uh, a percentage from 10 to 15% of Pinot Nero, Pinot Noir, okay? So is a blend Prosecco Rosé from Glera, 85 to 90%, and uh, Pinot Nero from the same area, from uh, Eastern Veneto and Friuli, uh, and Pinot Noir. What's the difference? What makes Torresella different from the other producer? We have the vineyards very close to the winery. So when we harvest, and we harvest in the early morning, because during the day, at the end of August, usually it's very hot. So very early in the morning, in order to have fresh bunches, we arrive to the winery very quickly. And so we can press fresh fruit without any need uh, of cooling to match it because it's very fresh. The second element, Pinot Noir. In the vineyards, we have the Pinot Noir coming from Champagne clones. Okay, we are in Eastern Veneto, but they are clones studied to be sparkled. Okay, it's not Burgundy or other places clones, so they, they have high acidity to give freshness. And the third is in the winery. We use horizontal tanks, horizontal tanks for second fermentation and staying on the lease at least three months on the lease. And horizontal tanks give the possibility to have a wider surface of uh, sparkling wine in contact with dead yeast or lees, as you want to call it. And it gives not leasy flavor because we need nine months or one year in order to get leasy flavors, but it, this gives the possibility to have a long lasting, like a, an underground energy in the wine uh, that we can see in the final products. And so this, this mix of these three elements, closeness to the winery and the Pinot Noir of uh, Champagne clones and horizontal tanks make something different compared uh, with the, the other producers of the, of the area. It's very interesting uh, style of uh, sparkling wines. We have a lot of uh, rosé in Italy. This is a rosé that can, uh, is, can use the aromatic compounds of glera, grapes, or terpenes, notes, floral, and together with the wild berries, red berries, notes of uh, the Pinot Noir grapes, by exploiting, uh, they are, sorry, I forget to say they are fermented separately because they come from different vineyards and harvested in different period of times. And then they are blended before second fermentation, only at the last moment before the second fermentation in horizontal tanks for, and before putting in the tanks. Another important thing of Torresella, they stay on the lease of the first fermentation for a longer period, at least two to three months. We are not in a hurry to enter in the tank to be ready in December or, or in January. We can go out only in January. We, can the, we can do the things in a slow way in order to exploit all the potential of glera and Pinot Noir grapes before blending and exploit, as you say, the mosaic in this case is only two uh, not perfect elements that together make, a, in my opinion, a very interesting spark, red, uh, rosé sparkling wine. And then I 
I want to enjoy with you. Yes. I tell you, I'm, I'm very much enjoying this as well. Slightly different in structure than the uh, Prosecco Superiore. This, I tend to find the, there's a creaminess to it. And I definitely get that little bit of uh, berry, very light uh, berries and currants to the wine. Really makes it lovely, um, even more so as, a, uh, as an aperitif, a um, little bit softer and rounder. A uh, lot of fun wine. And again, I can even see having this maybe just touching on certainly with savories, but maybe even some some little savory desserts with some berries and whatnot. I think this would go very nicely. Uh, also, some uh, aperitifs would be fantastic. So thank you, Alberto. Thank you so much. All right. And next up is Jacob Gregg, who is brand ambassador for Cadel Bosco in the U.S. We traveled together when Jacob was a Psalm at Sea Island and other venues in Georgia. Uh, we work closely together on the Crew Artisan College team, and I had both the pleasure of visiting Cadel Bosco earlier this month and also speaking with the proprietor Maurizio Zanella about a new development with their um, famous Cuvée Prestige. Jacob, you want to shed some light on that for us? Thanks, Lars. I'd love to. So the wine you see on my side here, Cuvée Prestige, a Dizione 43, it is kind of the culmination of, of what we've done in the last uh, many decades, and it's not a change from the Cuvée Prestige you might have had or, or seen before that was previously labeled as Extra Brut. Uh, this is in fact also an Extra Brut, but you'll notice on the label where we're representing it as the 43rd edition or Edizione uh, of this wine. And, and that numerical starting point was with our first multi-vintage blend. It's something that we're really known for at Carabosco within Franciacorta is presenting uh, this multi-vintage Cuvée, not just uh, aging our wine less and not using a vintage, which is, is quite common, but, but adding older vintages for complexity uh, as, as well, of course, as consistency. So what we're doing is we're adding the transparency so that each year that we make a different blend, a different cuvee, if you will, within the cuvee prestige, you can know if you'd like the particularities of that exact wine. In the past and with many other producers of, of a multi-vintage or non-vintage wine, you kind of know a generality of what the wine is in of itself. But here with the Dizione 43, I, I don't have to tell you that it's about this much Chardonnay or it's about this many vineyards. Uh, I can tell you that this wine that uh, we're tasting together today is exactly 189 vineyards that went into it, uh, that it has 84% Chardonnay and that it's, it's blended with 14% Pinot Noir, two Pinot Bianco. So it's this added transparency uh, to the multi-vintage process. Of course, you'll, you'll probably note uh, especially as, as we have a, a group of sommeliers joining us, that this is something a few producers in other regions like France have done. And, and we're happy to take that lead and, and have seen that there's been a positive reception there. So what we're doing is bringing that to the first in Italy to represent a multi-vintage wine this way and, and really showcase uh, the details, the, the dedication, the, the persistent level of quality and, and attention to detail that Carabosco takes with our wines uh, and allowing that transparency to be evident with uh, what is considered our flagship wine. This is a wine that, that you can see behind me, the territory of Franciacorta. This is a beautiful place that, that spans 19 different communes. The wine in, in front of you, the, the wine next to me, I suppose, uh, comes from 10 of those. It comes from various different elevations and, and some of the very best sites there. So this wine really represents the terroir of Franciacorta. And specifically, uh, you can even use the, to get the details quite quickly, there's a QR code on the back of the label, takes you directly directly to the text sheet. So in the moment, let's say the table was asking you what goes into this wine, you could know exactly how much reserve wine, exactly how much Pinot Noir if you needed. And it's just that quick little step away from the table to get that info. So uh, we're pretty excited about it. I think it's been really well received. And uh, we just like sharing the details of what we do with folks. And this is a great expansion of that. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. And I know the, uh, the Psalm community loves hearing those details. Um, I, I just love the fact that you guys emphasize the fact that it's multi-vintage, not non-vintage. Non-vintage is a negative. I love positive accentuations. Uh, this wine has beautiful complexity, and I love the fact that it, it doesn't change every year, but it does evolve. Uh, it does evolve based on vintage conditions and based on, uh, you know, when, when you, hopefully uh, anybody here who hasn't already done so will get the chance to visit the Cod del Bosco winery. And at the reception area, they have this beautiful, um, life not life size but a, a a map what would you call it jacob it's a it's we, a we, we call it a reproduction of the regions so that you can see within one room what the the elevation changes are where our specific vineyards are and, and without 
maybe taking a helicopter over the region, it might be the best way to experience what French Accorda has uh, as a territory. Yeah, it's a relief map, exactly. And you have those little lights that show the different vintage, the different vineyards that you take from the area. So in a sense, this is a mosaic as well. I like that, uh, continuing that theme. So thank you, beautiful complexity. This is a very special wine. Thank you very much, Jacob. Here's Lars. And I know we call it a wine, not a sparkling wine. It was, it was a wine. Your uh, Maurizio Zanella always insists on that. So that's a wonderful fact. Um, so next up is Christina Sazama. I've had the pleasure of traveling uh, the Wine Ed Network with Christina over the years and presenting together on some journal panels around the country. Uh, she is one of America's top educators and here to talk to us about Lugana, a wine that I've really only, I've really only gotten to know more about in the past few years with its Tour de Viana grape and its multi-regional denomination at the foot of Lake Garda. It's a wine that I think deserves a little bit more exposure. So Christina, tell us more. Yeah, and thank you so much. And so for Lugana, because it's not as well known, let me just set the stage and say that we're, we're traveling east of Francia Corta. And like Lars said, the Lugana appellation actually straddles the border between Lombardy and the Veneto. It's actually one of the few cross-border appellations in Italy. And so Lugana is in the southern shores of Lake Garda, and Lake Garda itself is Italy's largest lake. There it is in the background. Um, and it's the third deepest lake. So clearly, the lake is going to have a, a significant impact on the local climate here. Um, and grapes, of course, like, like in many parts of Italy, they've been grown since Roman times. But Lugana as a DOC has only been around since the late 60s. So it is a relatively new appellation. Um, and so um, one thing to know about the Lugana area, and you see in the foreground here, that's actually the Camayol winery. And you can see our distance to Lake Garda there. Over the years, the, there have been more and more plantings away from the lake, you know, more plantings uh, away from the shore towards the auto route. And so you can imagine that those vineyards are going to have less of an influence of the um, of the influence of Lake Garda here. And um, what is that influence of Lake Garda? I, I really want to emphasize the importance here. Um, one thing to think about with Lugana is that sort of latitude wise, we're fairly far north. We're actually at about 45 degrees latitude north, which would be sort of in the same neighborhood as Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Yet here in, in uh, Lugana, we actually, not only are we growing vines, um, but we're, there's a commercial production of lemons here. There are olive orchards among the vineyards here. And, and I, I don't think you're getting something like that in, in Portland. So, so that is being one of the, the largest lake and being a very deep lake, it is protecting, it's a long lake. It's protecting from the colder winds up north there. And um, obviously being a deep lake, it's gonna take a lot of energy to change the temperature of the, the water. So it's really sort of moderating the influence here um, more than you would if we were say, you know, uh, further away like that. So Kamayol benefits from the lake effects. And so we're getting full ripeness and freshness. And then we sort of maintain that by treating it very, I'm going to say transparently in the uh, winery. And so um, the local grape that, uh, that is in the Maiolo uh, from Kamayol here is called Turbiana or also called Trebbiano de Lugana. And it's not a very well-known grape to consumers, um, but I, I think it is actually, it's got a wonderful sort of fruitiness and, and, and freshness that I think appeals to um, a lot of more casual wine consumers, as well as, you know, it's Turbiana. Who doesn't love Italy because of the, you know, diversity of friggin' grapes we have all over the place? Um, so I really like this fresh and, and very energetic expression of the wine. I don't know what well you got said. There. Well said, Christina. You know, uh, again, to your point, you, you say Italian grape varieties, Torbiana. Oh, you mean Trebbiano? No, I mean Torbiana. There are over 3,000 different uh, grape varieties in Italy. Charles de Gaulle uh, complained in France after World War II about trying to govern a country that had 450 cheeses. That explains why nobody can govern Italy because of 3,000 different grape varieties. 
with apologies to my Italian political compatriots, but we all know it's true. Uh, I just love this. This Camaiol is making a beautiful wine here. The wine has got some beautiful freshness, complexity, roundness. It's the kind of wine you can see enjoying uh, with some fish right out of the lake right there. But even going into some of the farms in the area, because you're getting pretty close there to the, um, the Po Valley, which is the heartland and a lot of pork and, and, and different foods that are coming from there. Uh, this wine has beautiful uh, complexity to go with all of it. So thank you very much, Christina. Thank you. So now we're going to bring back Vittorio to speak to us about Vermentino. Vermentino is a quintessentially Italian grape variety. It's grown in three places in Italy, Liguria, Sardinia, and Tuscany, with varied interpretations based on the place uh, within each area. It's said that the variety likes to see water uh, but as a coastal grape, but in Tuscany, it doesn't mind heading a little bit inland. Who isn't attracted to the inland of Tuscany? Um, so tell us, please, Vittorio, about Vermentino in the Marema and how it behaves in your Sassorigale vineyards. Very well. Thank you, Lars. Uh, so yeah, as you said, yeah, Vermentino is definitely um, um, one of the best known uh, Italian white varieties. Um, of course, alternative to other more famous uh, variety like Pinot Grigio is for the international consumers. And uh, yes, it's, uh, it's planted in, in different regions of Italy and also it bears different names according to the, the history, the tradition that uh, that particular uh, region ha has developed. Um, not only that, but uh, if we're looking at the, the Italian wine regions uh, in terms of uh, potential application, I think that uh, we, we can state that the Vermentino is allowed in about 60% of, the, of the, 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 the Italian wine region in terms of appellation. So that makes a, you know, a, a, a strong statement about how we believe in these uh, varieties. Um, yes, Marema Toscana is a very particular uh, terroir for who doesn't know. Um, we are in the southwest part of Tuscany, um, so we're like uh, between Montalcino and the coastline of uh, uh, Grosseto, is the, the province, the, the capital in, 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 uh, in this uh, region. Um, so in, if you just um, uh, draw a line, you know, in the sky from where we are in, in, um, in Paganico uh, district uh, to Montalcino is just like 15 uh, kilometers. But of course, the, the rolling hills, be, you know, the separates the Montalcino to the, to the coastline, um, you know, uh, uh, force the, 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 the drive to be around like, you know, even a, a hour, a hour and 15 minutes. But you know better than me because you've been around for a long time, right, in that area, in your past career and the present. And um, so in, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the expression of Vermentino here, so the definitely uh, we can work, uh, uh, this is a good point, we can work with organic grapes uh, because of the microclimate, so very dry uh, summer. Sometimes we, we go all over like 100 Fahrenheit degrees, of course the photosynthesis tends to stop at that point, but uh, um, the selection, the clonal selection that we did uh, uh, for, for the, this particular uh, area allows the, the grapes, the, the vines to, to survive and adapt. Um, then we have, of course, the, um, the warm, uh, um, you know, heat, the weather. Um, the, the precipitation uh, is, is pretty low compared with the, the heart of, the, of the Tuscany, just two hours uh, away that we're going to talk about later about the Chianti Classico. We're here about probably five to 600 millimeters of precipitation per year. And then that's considered pretty, pretty low for, for, for this area, for Tuscan in general. Yeah. Also, the, 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 the Vermentino can be associated to the Sauvignon Blanc uh, in somehow to our you know, less expert uh, consumers. So it's a good way to introduce an uh, Italian varieties in the, in, you know, to, with the international appeal in somehow. Uh, how, how is the expression here? We get uh, definitely the citrus uh, uh, component, uh, um, good fruit precision. Um, um, I like the, the, the stone, the purity of the, of the fruit. 
um, and then the herbal edge with the, the, the what we call the fresh herbs uh, as yeah. opposed to the more, more dry uh, herbs that we're going to see later in, in Sardinia. So here you have more the, the, the rosemary, the sage uh, component to me. Um, it's uh, also an interesting thing, you know, because uh, the, the saberness is more uh, uh, evident here than the sort of a saltiness. You, you refer to the, to the shore component, to the shore influence. Definitely, yes, we are 20, 25 kilometers from the shore, but because of the, of the, you know, the rolling hills between here and the shore, the air gets uh, warmer. And so even the, there is not that such the, 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 the kick, the salty kick that we could uh, even find in, in other areas in the, the coastal, uh, very, very short, close to the shoreline. Um, and, uh, and uh, I, I like the parallel, like uh, if you think about the bread in Tuscany, bread in Tuscany is not salty, right? And so in somehow even the, the wines, especially white wines, tends to be on the dry edge of the, of the, of the you know, the texture here. So it, it is also in this case, Vermentino is more savory than, than salty. Um, other than that, Andrea Daldini is our winemaker here, uh, the, 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 the head winemaker of uh, also uh, Lamole di Lamole. And uh, he's been with us with 30 plus years, so has a tremendous expertise uh, uh, you know, in these regions. Uh, and we explored this uh, territory early in the um, 2000 when we decided to start planting the vineyards and, and create the winery at the farm where we are today. So it's been, uh, you know, a project that my family has embraced from from scratch, and today we're, you know, we're pretty um, happy about that. Uh, so, salute. as you should be, salute. Um, thank you, Vittorio. I, I, I guess I qualify as a as a not too expert wine taster there because I find the similarities also with Sauvignon Blanc. Um, definitely that brightness, that freshness, that steeliness. Uh, it's what I love. And I definitely get what you're talking about, about the fresh uh, herbs, what uh, we like to call the Machia Mediterranea. Um, I always imagine the, the Marema as that the sea breeze kind of sweeping over those the first hills where the herbs are growing wild and bringing that salinity and, and herb, herbiness um, to, to the air. You know, the, I, I had the pleasure, as you mentioned, of living in, uh, in Tuscany, probably about half, almost about halfway between the seaside and Montalcino itself. And the basically that area just outside of Paganico where you guys are is where the Marema ends and Mont the hills start to rise toward Montalcino. So uh, it's kind of neat to just, as I said earlier, take it a little bit inland, uh, gives the wines great character, but they're not missing out on those wonderful sea breezes that give this wine some beautiful character. Now, as a, as a sort of, uh, a contraposition we're going to bring back to Christina to talk about Vermentino, but perhaps in more classic rendition, uh, which is from Sardinia. Uh, it thrives there on those windswept coastal vineyards of Cantina Mesa. Uh, your winemaker, Stefano Cova, who comes from Trentino Alto Adige, told me, I don't know if he cursed when he said it, he might have, but uh, he told me that he can count on one hand the number of days without wind in Sardinia. But there are plenty of days with wine in Sardinia, and we thank goodness for that. So, Christina, tell us about classic Sardinian Vermentino, please. And it is. It's about the wind and the wine. And um, first of all, of course, Sardinia being an absolutely uh, beautiful and mountainous region. And if you've ever had the good fortune of being there, um, you would you would know that this is an uh, this is an island that is basically a huge like museum, outdoor museum of soil types. That's actually the winery there um, in the middle and the uh, grapes for Mesa Junco, one of the vineyard sources is right there in front of the winery, literally looking out at the Mediterranean. So this is obviously a very classic Mediterranean climate, but as Lars said, the, the real important element of the terroir for Cantina Mesa is going to be the winds. Um, and so just to set the stage really briefly, when we think about Vermentino from Sardinia, there's that one DOCG on the north of the island, but Cantina Mesa is in the southwest corner of Sardinia. And there are several different winds that come through this area pretty much on a constant basis. Um, 
Apparently, this is the, the place for world class kite surfing because yes. the winds are that reliable. Yeah. So, the, the one wind that really does come through and sort of cuts through the southwest area here is the Mestrale, which is the same as the Mistral up in France. Of course, up in France, it's coming down and it's bringing a lot of the cold air from the north. But when it gets down to Sardinia, it's picked up a lot of warmer air from the Mediterranean Sea. So that's gonna be the most significant wind in that it's pretty much constant. Um, the next wind we have is the Sirocco, which is coming from the south. If you actually look at a map of Sardinia, you'll see that, that this little southwest corner is actually closer to um, northern Africa than it is to mainland Italy. And with the Sirocco, that's bringing sand as well as very, very warm winds. There's also the Levante coming from the east. But the result of all of this is that Basically, the, the vine is constantly being shaken around. It's being constantly beat up. And, and as you would expect, kind of the way that a human would, I guess, react, is that it's growing thicker skins. And so the Vermentino here has a very different expression um, because of that. It is thicker skins. And then once we get it into the cellar, we do a little bit of skin contact to get a little bit of that texture. Um, and it's a moderate temperature fermentation, again, to extract from the skins. Um, the other thing I love about the wines, you just saw, you know, you can see there's there's the vineyard right in, in front of the, uh, the one of the vineyards right in front of the winery, um, the salty kick on the finish of this wine. Absolutely love it. And compared to Tuscany, I find, you know, they're talking about the more of the fresh herbs in Tuscany. I find it is more of a dried herbal expression, which could be, again, related to the winds going on here, but I, I, I have a soft spot for this one. <laughs> oh, you're on. Oh, yeah, here we go. There you, Lars, you're on mute. Damn it. Damn it. Thank you. I committed you're the gone. cardinal sin of Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> my landscapers are here so i'm trying to make sure they don't uh, get too close i'm on long guy land um but what i love about this wine is that it's this elegance that it has this blousey elegance that is so classic um and you know it's almost not fair to compare the two vermentinos there are three thousand grape varieties in in italy but some of them might be the same uh, they just behave so differently in different terroirs. And I think that's the beauty of what we tasted with the Sasso Regale compared to this. They're both Vermentino, but different styles. The Sasso Regale even has a twist off, which is perfect because it expresses its, its freshness. Uh, whereas the, the cork, pull, the cork uh, finish in the Junco uh, sort of expresses that more classic taste, that fuller body. You know, in the opera Tosca, um, the, 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 the main character gets caught singing a love song to his girlfriend, his muse, who he's painting as a Madonna, but he's comparing her to his brunette lover, Tosca, uh, and talks about racondita armonia. Beauty can come in so many different styles and fashions and ways. So these are both two beautiful executions of Vermentino. And thank you guys for sharing them with us. But now we're going to, uh, I mentioned Trentino Alto Adige earlier, and Alberto was going to bring us back to Trentino Alto Adige to tell us about Ketmeyer, which is actually the place, the winery where I met Alberto for the first time a few years ago at the 100th anniversary of the Ketmeyer cellars there. Uh, it is a land that once belonged to my Austrian ancestors, but today is part of my Italian uh, ancestry as a, uh, as, a, as a mixed breed that I am. So Alberto, tell us a little bit and uh, try not to yodel when you're speaking about it, but tell us a little bit about Ketmeyer, please. Yes, it's a pleasure. With a great, great pleasure, you see a wonderful landscape on the yeah. background. And we are in the mountains. We are very close to Austria border. And uh, you see on the label, you see the word Alto Adige, the appellation name, but together with Alto Adige, you can read Sutirol. It means that we have double language because this is a German speaking province or region, as you like, German speaking, because we are close and it was uh, connected to Italy, became part of Italy only, only 102 years ago in 1919, the same uh, year as was founded, uh, Ketmai was founded. So Ketmai was founded in Alto Adige, the same year that 
it became Italian part, but the German language and mentality is in uh, the wines too. So they have a creativity of Italian and at the same time the precision and so the austerity, yes, like you Lars, <laughs> of, of the German uh, is, a, is a really particular place because of uh, altitude or different altitude because we have a valley floor and very high altitude, different exposure according to the valleys, different kind of soils from oranic to uh, volcanic, so different um, conditions and over the centuries it uh, brought to uh, a parcelling of the ownership. So we have ve a very large number of small growers and in Katmire and, and the large number, sorry, of uh, varieties because of the different positions. So we can find Pinot Grigio, but Pinot Bianco, Müller Togau, Gewürztraminer, or Pinot Noir, uh, Grüner Weltliner, Silvaner, so many, many wines and every kind of varieties have this ideal place to grow. And one particularity of Alto Adige or Südtirol is uh, the Maso Chiuso, is a particular institution when you have a, a farmyard with a house, orchard and vineyards, you can write on the book of Maso Chiuso and you pay very low taxes in order because you can keep, you maintain the, the territories, the okay, sustainability of the territories. But at the same time, you have, when you have to pass uh, to the uh, like heritage, you can't divide it to the, your sons or daughters, but you have to give only to the eldest son or eldest daughters, but if he or she doesn't want, can give to the others, but can keep its, uh, okay, its, um, its borders, it can be divided. And this was very useful because it preserved a, a further subdivision of the ownership in this very subdivided area. So we have a lot of relationships, a multi-generational uh, relationship with small growers of muscle in different position in order to exploit different altitude climatic subsoils. And uh, in this case is a Pinot Grigio in a very good position at, uh, in order to take from these Mm, copper skin colored grape, but fermented off the skins. So in a white version that I was to remind that Santa Margarita was the first one 60 years ago to, to put on the market in this version, this is Katmaya. So it means in that area of Alto Edige, uh, vinified by Katmaya method and give the possibility to enjoy the character of a Pinot Grigio grapes that is body, some oily structure in the same time, pear and green apple flavors that are typical of, of, these, of these areas because Alto Adige is very famous for apples to the export apples everywhere in the world, very high quality apples. And, but in this case, in this region, you can taste in this wine, the precision of the Germans, or the Germans, the Austrian, sorry. Austrians. And yes, of the Austrians and the creativity of Italian in one wine. And here I am in one person, my Austrian and Italian heritage. So thank you. <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm enjoying most about this golden age that we're living uh, about for wines is that we're starting to discover Pinot Grigio can be so different, so many expressions. We, we just talked about Vermentino having different expressions in different areas. And it's the exact same way as Pinot Grigio. A lot of Americans have think that Pinot Grigio is one multi-dimensional thing, but in reality, Pinot Grigio can be many, many different things depending on where it's made, how it's grown, different producers. And that's a wonderful thing to draw from. This is a beautiful, rich, creamy uh, Pinot Grigio that really has a lot of body and stuffing to it um, that, that defies its, its northern heritage. So bravo. And I also like, you know, that, that Mazo Chiuso 
I, you just think about, I'm an entomologist too. Etymo I love the etymology of words, the origin of words. So if you think about the French word mas for a farm, and if you think about um, the, the term massal selection all coming from farm, so it makes it very logical for us to realize, oh, maso cuso, now I understand, a closed farm. Uh, yeah, so they protect right. the integrity of that of that land and uh, where that area comes from, rather than dividing it into even micro parcels. So, bravo, very good. Thank you, Alberto. Yeah, it's a pleasure. So now we're going to go back to Vittorio, who is with us to discuss Lamole di Lamole, a very unique estate that I was introduced to Vittorio by your brother Alessandro a few years ago, and I had the pleasure of broadcasting a harvest report live. I think it was 2020 with winemaker Andrea Daldin through the Psalm Journal on uh, the 2020 vintage. La Mole is in a very unique position because it is so high up. Uh, I know my ears popped a few times riding up there. Uh, and actually it was recently approved for a new subzone in Chianti, one of the smallest ones at that. So can you tell us more, Vittorio, about this Unita Geografica Aggiuntiva, please? Oh, of course, my pleasure. So yes, uh, first, uh, le let me go back to a little bit of history here because uh, I'm, we're very proud as a family uh, to have, you know, uh, to, com to, to have committed on this uh, particular territory in Chianti Classico uh, back in the early 90s. So we're talking about 30 years, uh, more than 30 years ago. As I mentioned before, our local uh, uh, current winemaker, Andrea Daldin, has been with us since then. And uh, the commitment was the commitment of the family to, to, to be the guardians of this territory, uh, Lars. As you can see, the, and you, you've been there, uh, they're very, it's a very extreme uh, viniculture uh, that uh, was made uh, possible since the, the, you know, back to the Romans times, uh, um, thanks to the terracing uh, that you can see. So the terracing uh, uh, the, the allowed the, the, the growers here to, to, to work the land. And, um, and the, the, the thing is the elevation, uh, you know, it's very high. So we're in a, in a sort of a, um, like um, um, uh, forest environment with a, with a such incredible biodiversity that really helps also to work in, in an organic practices up here. So uh, all that said, uh, yes, the, today, just to jump uh, 30 years uh, 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 ahead, we, uh, in June uh, this year, the, the Consortium of Chianti Classico, so, you know, who's the... Uh, um, the authority who regulates the, the, the local law, uh, the local uh, laws uh, for production, and, and issued a new uh, sort of a, a map mapping the, the the historical area, so the classical district, which was previously um, made by eight different municipalities between Siena and Florence. And now, yes, we're still in the same area, so the 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 the, the area hasn't been. Uh, uh, expanded in terms of uh, um, acres, uh, but what I, what is the, the the difference is that we they created they they came out with this new idea of a sub zone. So the the, the geographical units uh, that now are eleven. So some of those uh, um, bigger municipalities, like even Graven County, where Lamole is uh, belongs to, uh, now uh, has uh, three different uh, sub zones. So you have the Graven County, you have uh, as a sub appellation, you have uh, Lamole, and you have uh, nearby just across the, uh, the 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 hill is Panzano. Um, so this is important because uh, first uh, Lamole finally is, 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 is yes, is what is the smallest unit, uh, but it's also uh, one of the highest, so very with a very particular uh, terroir. And, and, and so we're very proud because of the, you know, all this work that we put together in these past 30 years. And uh, now we, you know, we were a, a very strong driver for, for, the, for the consortium to uh, establish this Islamole as a subzone. And, and a lot of uh, uh, producer, prestigious producer now um, that, you know, they've been around for a long time in other areas of, of Chianti Classico. Now they're looking at Lamole, you know, in terms of uh, potential acquisition and they are looking for land because the terroir here is really unique. So uh, when it comes to the, to the, to the wine, uh, of course we have uh, uh, different wines here. The wines that we're having today is our straight uh, uh, Chianti Classico. 
uh, which uh, you know resembles the color, the label of blue. We we call we say, we call it blue label. Or we used to call it blue label. And um, this is a, um, a, 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 a talking about mosaic of wines. I think this is uh, also interesting because, of course, the blend here is a is a Sangiovese with a little bit of Merlot and then Cabernet Sauvignon. So it's about eighty five percent now uh, Sangiovese and the rest uh, uh, Cabernet Merlot. But the mosaic is is interesting because if you look at the where these these grapes they, they come from they go from the bottom part of the property which is about 400 to 420 meters uh, with the with the with the cab and, and the Sangiovese but the Merlot comes from the top from the highest elevation which is about um, 600 and, 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 and 20 650 meters so we have a bigger excursion between the bottom and the top, even in terms of uh, you know, microclimate within the same property, pretty amazing. Uh, just to give you an idea, the maximum allowed for viniculture today is 700 meters. So we're right the, you know, very close to the, to the, to the, um, the limit. Um, so we, we, we really talk about uh, this mountain style of Chianti, classico, which is uh, to me is usually more like the, yes, you have the tradition, of course, but also the elegance and the finesse given by this, uh, uh, you know, mix of, of uh, variables that are part of this uh, terroir. Um, uh, we, 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 we talk about, you know, the cherry, the, 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 the bright cherry uh, fruit, uh, we have some spices uh, uh, that are typical of the Sangiovese, but the, you know, it's it's it kind of a very soft in terms of tannins uh, without being uh, too aggressive. That sometimes, especially a straight Sangiovese, straight Chianti Classico, needs uh, quite time to to evolve and develop and get ready. Because maybe that the, we're lucky and we're fortunate to be up here, the wine tends to have this very subtle, um, uh, you know. Uh, sort of a sweetness, but not sweetness of, you know, the residual sugar, just the fruit concentration, the natural concentration of the fruit that really brings up the aromatics also because of the, the harvest time that tends to be uh, almost two or three weeks uh, uh, after, you know, later, sorry, the, the, the valley floor. So this is allowed the Sangiovese in high elevation to, to uh, get matured and uh, fully ripe and uh, and brings up the the aromatics and lower the acidity so that's that's the idea behind and a lot of other things we could stay here an hour uh, just to talk about this this winery uh, but i know time is in the essence today so <laughs> oh we could go on and on um but thank you vittorio I, I have to say again keeping up with that theme of etymology lamole comes from the word lamo which means a blade and this is literally a blade of land on a very high precipice high up uh, and you can see that you can you can taste it in the wines. This high altitude makes the wines very elegant. Uh, the addition of Merlot is not meant to try to make it a super Tuscan. The addition of the Merlot, because the Merlot was grown up on that high altitude too. And to your point, Vittorio, it sort of softens that little bit of aggression that Sangiovese can get from a high altitude. I love these wines. Um, you know, you you were pointing out behind you, we can still see the terraces there, the stone terraces, and Andrea. Point, Daldine pointed out to me that those are actually part of the microclimate because they're so high up, the reflection of the sun, very strong sun, you can taste the sun in this wine, um, but the reflection of the sun actually adds to the microclimate, which I think is fascinating uh, and, and, and very important. And, and again, we talked about the variations of Pinot Grigio, we talked about the variations of Vermentino, and you can do the same thing with Chianti, especially so, and that's the one good thing. Hopefully these new uh, subzones and and um, and microzones don't add to any confusion, but help the consumer and the wine lover realize that Chianti in Italy and its grape varieties are truly a mosaic that really needs to be delved into and enjoyed very much. So thank you very much for that, Vittorio. And uh, now we're going to come back to wrap it up with Cristina, uh, who have I've had um, the pleasure of many discussions with Raffaele Boscaini, who is the proprietor of Masi. I also had the pleasure of working with his father, Sandro, in the UK in the 1990s when we had a common distributor. Uh, and I also got the pleasure of speaking with Andrea Dalcin, 
who was part of the Mozzie technical group, which is their team approach to winemaking, which is also fantastic and, and, and cutting edge and, and avant-garde. Um, he took the time out of a very busy harvest season to have lunch with me at Mozzie's Tenuta Canova State off Lake Garda near Verona. And uh, we enjoyed Campo Fiorin when we were there. Campo Fiorin is fascinating. I remember when they were selling this in the UK, it was Italy's first ripasso, it was something very new. Uh, and the family then gave the name ripasso to the denomination, but evolved Campo Fiorin into something different. So Christina, would you tell us what the evolution of Campo Fiorin has been, please? Yes, it is, uh, it is no longer uh, a ripasso, but just to step back and set the stage, um, we're in the Valpolicella area, just north of that very romantic town of Verona, of Romeo and Juliet fame. And I think for your more casual consumers, Valpolicella is probably not super well known, but the main wine of the region, Amarone, it definitely is. And, and the technique of this area, um, and you see it here um, in, in the photo, is the appassimento technique. And that is a technique of partially drying the grapes before you start fermentation. And so Amarone uh, uses 100% of these partially dried grapes. But today we're talking about the Campo Fiorin, which is actually a super Venetian that adopts some of the practices here. And so the, the Campo Fiorin uh, first introduced in 1964. So, you know, Lars, like you said, it has been around for a while and it was called a super Venetian back in the 60s, which I know everyone is probably more familiar with the term super Tuscan. Um, and that term goes back to the 1970s or so. I'm, I'm kind of charmed that Mazi was using the term super Venetian in their advertising in the mid 60s when the Campo Fiorin was uh, released. So before super Tuscan was even a word. Right, um, right. And we're saying super Venetian here because we are making a wine using a double fermentation method. When this wine was first introduced in 1964, it was new in that it used the Rapasso method. Um, you know, like Lars said, there's actually um, a technical group here that basically, because this family goes back to 1772, so they have a lot of experience in this region. And so this technical group sort of takes apart each part of the process and, you know, holds it up to the light and, and tries experiments to see if there's a better way of making this wine. So Campo Fiorin, when it was first introduced in 1964, was a Rapasso. And just to sidebar for a minute, Rapasso is the technique of using the, the skins of the Amarone. So, you know, the pressed skins of the Amarone and putting it into a tank of fresh Valpolicella juice. And so you get more color and you get new flavors and, and all that good stuff. And that was first introduced um, by Mazi in the 60s via the Campo Fiorin here. But of course, the, the family has always been experimenting and, and evolving. And so Mazi doesn't use, even though they invented it, they don't use the Rapasso technique anymore. Because if you think about it, the Rapasso technique using just the skins of the Amarone, you know, it does have the color and flavors and everything, but a lot of the bitter compounds are also located in the skins of the grapes. So imagine using a, a tea bag for the second time. Uh, it's not, you know, there's going to be a lot of tannin and whatnot, a little bitterness in that second cup of tea. So, so while this was the original Rapasso, they were experimenting and they came up with this double fermentation technique, which is using the whole partially dried grapes. So they're using partially dried grapes pulp and skins, and they're adding that to the tank of what would be uh, fresh Valpolicella. So it is about 25% partially dried grapes. Um, since about the 1980s, they've been using this double fermentation technique. So it does have more color, it does have more flavors, but it also gives you that sort of plush um, plush palette expression that you typically get out of Amarone. So it, it maintains that, that freshness of Valpolicella, that bright, crunchy red fruit, but it also has the integrity of Amarone from that sort of plush tannin profile here. And um, I think it's an absolutely beautiful wine. And like I said, since about the 1980s, they have been using the double fermentation technique um, and, and no longer use the Rapasso technique. So absolutely beautiful wine here. And yeah. Amen, amen to that. Um, yeah. A couple of things that really struck me from visiting them. First of all, Christina, on the on your 
background there, you've got the what they call arele. A lot of producers um, in Amarone today use either wooden boxes, which is a little bit more old fashioned or plastic boxes because they're more efficient for air. But what they do at Masi is they use these arele and these uh, large frames with bamboo um, mm -hmm. uh, reeds that run in between where the grapes dry uh, is a lot more challenging to use. But in theory, it gives you more character. It gives you a more open area for the grapes, which obviously when you have dried grapes or withering grapes, uh, you want to give them a, as much air as possible. And that allows this. Um, and that's a very unique method. These arele date back to the times when silk was more of an important production um, in, in the area than wine was. And so they had those, I don't want to say leftover, but they had them and they repurposed them for the aging of the, of the Amarone grapes. And it's a, it's a brilliant method and it's a sacrifice that Masi has made because it's certainly easier to use smaller boxes. Another thing that I think that's very important that they've done is that a lot of producers in Amarone tend to lean toward Corvinone uh, because Corvinone gives you a richer, fuller bodied wine, great grape, uh, not related to the Corvina, but similar. And so it takes its name from the bird, from the crow. But what Masi does is Masi uses a grape that very few Valpolicella producers use. They use more in Bartolino, which is Molinata, mm -hmm. which comes from, it gets this white film on it. So they gave it the term molinata, which means the uh, comes from the flour mills because it looks like somebody sprinkled powder on it uh, or, or flour on it. Uh, and that makes a wine that is much more elegant. And I have to say with this with this Campo Fiorin, the wine has beautiful elegance and structure. Sometimes a riposo, riposos can be wonderful wines, but they just they tend to extract a bit much, whereas this wine is really based on wonderful structure and elegance. So it's a real uh, special treat. And as I said, we enjoyed it quite a bit when we were in Italy this past uh, September. So thank you very much, Christina, for that. And thank you, Masi. Um, so I just want to remind everybody, thank you to the Psalm Journal. Thank you to Santa Margarita USA. I want to remind everybody that this was recorded and it will be available shortly on psalmjournal.com as well as um, uh, hopefully you guys will have it on your um sites as well for Santa Margarita, and it will be on our Facebook um, platform for the Psalm Journal. Please check out the study guide that was published in the August-September issue of the Psalm Journal, uh, either hard copy or online. Um, and I think this has been a wonderful virtual visit to Italy. I want to thank you guys all for expressing the passion and, and um, real research that goes behind this beautiful mosaic. Not every piece maybe is a perfect square, um, but they all come together to make something very, very special. And that is the beauty of Italian wines. So thank you very much. Thank you all for tuning in. And we look forward to having another discussion sometime soon. Arrivederci. Grazie. Ciao. Cheers. Thank you, Lars. Cheers. Cheers. Salute. Cheers. Salute. Salute. Grazie.